Good morning. My name is Brock Hanna. I am uh, a part of the Fort Twelve leadership team here at Marion Methodist. Um, today's scripture comes from Psalm 39 and it says this, brothers and sisters. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good, but my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with the tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone who around, goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all of my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth. For you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am over overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not... Be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me, that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, today we ask you to um, bless Mike and his message he has prepared today. Um, we ask you to help us become um, more aware of everything going on around us. Help us to be more aware of the words we say and the endless temptation the enemy throws our way and allow us to focus on you and you alone because we know that only in you comes eternal life and all other earthly idols that surround us daily are meaningless. We, a we ask all of this in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. The sermon today goes like this. A Baptist friend of mine once we were, we were in a ministerial alliance And he said, oh man, it's springtime That's that's belly button season for the Methodists, isn't it? And I'm like, what? He says, well isn't this the season of Lent? I said, no, Jim, it's Lent, Lent He says, I know, I change the filter every time I do the wash Anyway Hey, you know what? It is the holy season of Lent, and Christians engage in this across the world. We, we are in a season of preparing for the magnificent resurrection and reconciliation day that is Easter in the church. And Wednesday night at Ash Wednesday, I, I encourage something. I encourage it again here today as you go into this holy season that ends on April 4th to really add something of a spiritual discipline to your life. I, I said then, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what I added to my life this, this year, but also you may want to subtract something. You've heard the phrase, give something up for Lent. Uh, maybe you need to give something up uh, that's not healthy to your body, your mind, or your spirit, but really allow Lent to be a holy, holy time. Now, my friend Jim, the Baptist minister aside, Christians throughout the world uh, do a universal sharing of the holy season of Lent. And uh, as was true back in Advent, we are working, our preaching team here is working with a number of other pastors to construct this series. We meet every week to talk to the scriptures. I want to introduce them to you. Let's take a look at this picture. Up in the far left is the Reverend Joy Mitchell. She's the pastor at Walcott, which is the home of Iowa's greatest truck stop, you know. Uh, Simon, you know, on the far right, Brody Tuba, who's the pastor on the top row, is the pastor at Shuyville. Below him is John Luke, the pastor at um, Salem Church on the other side of town. Uh, of course, myself in the middle, and Nick Grove is the pastor at Sharon, which is basically kind of over by the old Cherry Burrell, uh, Sharon United Methodist Church. So they're the group that we've been working with, putting together this series that is the Songs 
of the heart. Now, each of those churches, each of their churches today, gets to see a brief video featuring me. But since I'm here, we can just skip that. <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Do I, do I hear affirmation? You, you want to see it? Our online attenders are, are smacking the screens with hearts. Is that what I hear? And, and amens. I heard the amen here already. Do I have some in-person affirmation to see this video? It's just brief. Oh, there we've got some cheer. Ah, oh, shucks. You guys are making me, making me, you know, so uncom... You know, just... Let's just take a look at it. One of the beautiful things about United Methodism is that we are connected in mission, ministry, and in the next few weeks, in worship. Your pastor, myself, and a few others have been working together in the study of the Holy Scriptures to prepare for the holy season of Lent. Today, we'll all be preaching on Psalm 39. I pray that you are blessed in the hearing of God's holy word today. And I do pray that you're blessed in the hearing of God's holy word you know, we, we talk about this series, Songs of the Heart. When we look at the Psalms, they're Israel's songbook. They're, they're, they're hymn book. And oftentimes in the songs that we sang, like our praise song sang today, you, you can take the deep spiritual truths that you believe in and, and put them to music. And, and, and when we sing those songs, we can express those deep truths in ways that maybe we can't say and we love to sing them music moves us it moves me I, I i love it my life has a soundtrack to it melodies and lyrics resonate in deep places that that maybe we would not be able to articulate without the beauty and the masterful nature of the songwriters putting them down they say what's deeply troubling and deeply important to us and so sometimes we need to let the music of our faith the songs of our hearts speak. You know, I got to tell you the truth. I struggle to be quiet with God. That, that's my self-admission this morning. I struggle to be quiet with God. My world is unavoidable, no, unavoidably noisy. The world around me is noisy all the time. I'm in these Zoom calls all the time. You know, give me an amen either online or here if you get Zoom calls all the time. Or Microsoft, you know, Teams or Google or whatever. But we're on them all the time right now. And while they're magnificent to have this, this uh, technology, I'm downtown Marion in the old Carnegie Library, right? So behind me is 7th Avenue. And I'm hearing all of the wonderful noise of the construction of that new library, I'm hearing uh, some noise of street work and, of course, the constant driving by of trucks and the occasional fender bender. But it's always noise. It's never quiet in that office. And mentally, I also have some unavoidable noise in my life, as do you, right? We have the noise of responsibility. We have, we have the noise of our families that is our joy and responsibility. We have the noise of our daily tasks that we have to get after. We have the noise of the things that we think we need to fix around our house or something like that. So my world is unavoidably noisy, but my world is also avoidably noisy. I, I sometimes create my own noise. <clears throat> I know you do too. I create noise with Netflix, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and for some of you that just want to make fun of me, MySpace. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, I actually do have a page out there I just haven't seen in 15 years. Um, so please don't go post something on it. The, and the music I listen to. I listen to a lot of music. And you can guess, can any of you guess the music that I was listening to all this week? Kansas, Dust in the Wind. It just, it just resonated all, and I, I thank Diane for giving it to me over and over during this sermon. But, but we have that, and, and those kind of noises are unavoidable because I, I put my own anno avoidable noise in my life. I put the earbuds, or the AirPods in my, my ears. I'm the one that's thinking about painting the ceiling that needs to get finished when I should be focusing on 
prayer or preaching or getting ready for a class. My life noise separates me. It, it sometimes prevents me from spending time to be quiet with God to deal with my big questions. You know, when I was in seminary, I had an apartment on the third floor of an apartment building in Denver, right on the campus of the University of Denver. And uh, our classes were in two-hour blocks. So I'd gone to an 8 o'clock class, and I just kind of plopped myself in my chair, looking straight out the window. Now, there was nothing romantic about looking out my window. We looked east, and of course in Denver you always want to look west. But I'm looking at, at University Boulevard, so I'm not looking at anything. But I sit down there, my roommate Scott goes to class, and I just sit there for two hours, I realize later, because he walks in. And he says, you're still here? I'm like, yeah. He says, well, are you solving all the world problems? I said, you know, Scott, sometimes I just need to be quiet with God. And I wrestled through that, and I did that a lot back then, just, just thinking about where I need to be and how I need to be in relationship with God and, 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 and just thinking through things. And that's why during Lent, I mean, sometimes, I want to tell you this because it's important to know, sometimes when preachers preach a sermon, they need to hear the message too. And so during Lent, I, I have picked up my old guide to prayer, and I'm being quiet the first 30 minutes of my day, every day, to pray for you, to pray over the scriptures for the day, um, to pray for, for God, for, for, for nation, community, and others, because I need that. I need to separate myself from some of the noise in my life, because here's what's happened, and it happens to a lot of us, is the noisy times get closer to each other, and sometimes they're even overlapping each other, and the quiet times get further and further apart. So the truth is, and that's my way of, this is my way of confession this morning, I need to be quiet with God, and that's me. Do you struggle to be quiet with God? Do you? Is your world unavoidably noisy? I mean, the world is really noisy right now. There's this guy, Bernie Krauss, and he uh, films nature. Okay, that's what he's been doing his whole career. And he gave this interesting statistic a couple years ago. He used to be able to set a camera out in nature and let it run. And he could get a full hour of complete silence if he let it run for 15 hours. 1968, that's how long it took. In 2018, so 50 years later, it took him 2,000 hours. That's 50 work weeks of 40 hours. 2,000 hours for him to get one hour of complete silence out in the woods. The world's getting more and more unavoidably noisy. There's real noise in your life. There's the real noise in your home. There's the real noise in your work environments. There's the noise of responsibility just like we all have, and we hear it. And it's unavoidable. And the question also needs to be asked, is your world avoidably noisy? Is there some noise in your world? Do you, do you fill your, your, your ears and your mind with Netflix and YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter? And we found this, this new thing that's trending. Listen to this. A new thing is trending right now called revenge sleep procrastination. Have you ever heard of this? I've never heard of it. But, but one of the guys whose pictures you saw on the screen presented it to us. So then I went out and read a couple articles about it. But this is what it is. It's, it's a phenomena that's starting to happy, happen in people whose lives are so busy. And they feel like there's so much noise in their lives that they want to claim some of it back. So instead of going to bed, going to sleep at their prescribed time, whether it's 9.30 or 10 or whatever, what they do is they take their electronic device, their iPad or their, or their phone in there, and they spend hours scrolling to this, that, and the other thing. And, and the article is about this woman that started her revenge sleep procrastination, and she says, I never go to sleep until it hits me. You know, my phone hits me in the face. That's when I go to sleep. And so I'm only getting like six hours of sleep a night because my life is so noisy, I'm trying to claim some of it back. Our minds are running a thousand miles an hour and we're concentrating on this when we should be completely dedicating ourselves to that. So again, the question, does your life noise separate you or prevent you from spending time to be quiet with God to deal with the big questions of life? Because the truth is, I need to be quiet with God. And the truth is, we 
need to be quiet with God. The scripture recognizes the tension of life and encourages us to claim our partnership with God. At first blush, when Brock was reading Psalm 39, it feels like this. It, it, it just feels like dust in the wind, doesn't it? It feels like dust in the wind. Everything we are and everything we're going to be, it's all dust in the wind. But that's not where we're going. But Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a, a few years before Kansas ever wrote that song down, in his Psalm of Life wrote these words, Time is fleeting. And our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. It doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? Now, the Scripture never sidesteps difficulty. The scripture Brock read just a couple moments ago. By the way, thanks for throwing yourself into that. I love it when people read the scripture that believe in it and that understand what it means. The scripture includes the tension of life. We are merely moving shadows. And all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Friends, that's dust in the wind. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. All we are is dust in the wind. So in this psalm, from beginning to end, this troubled soul speaks to us. He's reaching for assurance. He, he's reaching for in, in, out in the face of an, unanswered questions. He wants some explanation from God concerning the brevity of life and the significance of human life. What is it all about? Well, this brilliant writer named Simon Campbell writes this in our this week's Marian Methodist Growth Group curriculum so this is a heads up for those of you that are in a growth group the psalm writer knows that God is aware of the short span of his life and that God is his only hope his only hope for escape from his situation he also knows that he is powerless to endure his troubles without God God is his only hope and place of trust in a life that is a passing breath God is the only one he can turn to when he's overwhelmed by the struggle of life. We are powerless to endure our troubles without God. Powerless to block all the noise that is life without God. We need something to stake our lives on, to place our hope in. And the psalmist encourages us, amidst all the noise and tension, to turn to God. Which is why verse 7, I think, gives the climax here. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Now, I don't know the intonation of the song. We can't find the, the music that the Hebrews put to this. So, so we don't know if this is a throwing up our hands. But the way I read it, it it's, it's, it's the hymnal, the, 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 the hymnity is, my only hope is in you. It's, a, it's an affirmation. It's a, I know what to do. Because the psalmist moves from angst, everything is dust in the wind, to hope our lives truly, truly matter. In the face of discouragement, we must dare to claim our partnership with God. And so when you're overcome with worrisome noise, you ask yourself, how can I get from where I am right now to a face-to-face -face contemplative moment with the Lord? Now, I said at the beginning of this sermon that we're connected. We're connected not only right now to other churches. We're connected right now not only to other Christians, but we're also connected to a great and wonderful past. Eight centuries ago, a guy named St. Augustine wrote, the thought of God stirs in the human heart so deeply that we cannot be content unless we praise you because you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Our only hope is in you, O oh God. A different song in the same Hebrew songbook of the Psalms writes these words, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, O oh God, my living God. Where can I go and meet with you? See, there's something within us that richly craves a meeting with God. A face-to-face, -face, contemplative period of time with the one and only God. It's up to us. It's completely up to us to move from where we are 
to a place that's face to face with the Lord because the Lord never moves. So we're the ones that have moved away. We need to move to him. We need to first claim the desire for a meeting. We got to say, I want to meet. I want to meet with you, God, face to face. My son-in-law, Kirby, is over here. Kirby started for four years at Iowa State as a punter and played in the senior bowl, so he was really good at his craft. And after he graduated college, uh, deeply in love with my daughter, Lisa, I think is the reason he was there, he came to summer games, which is our summer camp. You've heard a little bit about it. Now, we all knew he was there because he was going to marry Lisa, everybody except her. She knew, didn't know that quite yet. But Kirby, among some of the kids that loved Iowa State football, was kind of a big deal. He still is a big deal in our family, but he was a pretty big deal. And so one of the eighth graders came up to me, and he says, oh, Pastor Mike, I want to meet him so bad. I said, well, he's eating in the dorms, and he's over there working out, and he's talking to small group. He says, but I just want to meet him so bad. I'm like, all right, Graham. And of course, I just grabbed him. I said, well, you're going to have to walk. I'm not going to carry you. But we walked over to Kirby, and I said, Kirby, Graham, Graham, Kirby. And then, being the good pastor I am, I walked off, left that kid on his own. You know, but Kirby, being uh, gentle and kind like he is, well, you know, talked to the kid for a few moments. Of course, kid didn't know what to say, but he had the meeting. He said, I want to meet him. So I made the introduction, but it was up to him as to what happened in the meeting. One of my professors in seminary always used to write and always used to say if you want to meet with God you got to drive your car there but you have to drive your own car there you have to get there on your own you have to find your way to get there you have to make the choice and the decision to go somewhere and have a meeting and understand that you're in control whether the meeting happens or not you got to drive your own car you got to make your own way you got to go to your meeting with God it's already prearranged you don't need some pastor or somebody else to grab you by the arm like I grabbed an eighth grader and put you together with God that's not necessary now one more push on this I, I, I want to say a good word about contemplation that's what the theme of this talk is about today what our song of the heart is all about contemplation is not just for mystics it's not just some Eastern practice. You don't need to go buy a bunch of crystals or get your little matches and your incense out. You don't even have to buy a pair of yoga pants to be in contemplation. You just need to find a quiet place. You need to find a place where you can have an internal reckoning with God and claim it. And there's a huge problem because contemplation is not the life we live. Contemplative living is not really where we're at. Our world is full of avoidable and unavoidable noise, and it's not going to quiet on its own. We have to be the ones that quiet it. We will have to drive our own car to an unfamiliar but very useful space, and that is a place where we're face to face with God. We can be quiet and be with Him. The opportunity to encounter, listen, and speak to God is the gateway to hope and peace, and I encourage you to take it. I absolutely encourage you to take it. Psalm 39 exemplifies the tension of theological contemplation. Silence to speech, despair to hope. The psalmist contemplates and speaks his way to hope. It wells up within him. The more he is quiet before God, the more he finds the right words to say to God. This is the opportunity to take before us uh, on the daily as well. Now let me give you a little reverse invitation and then we'll head on home. I'm going to give you a little reverse invitation to take the opportunity to encounter and listen and speak to God. Maybe some of you have seen these YouTubes. I, I, I love these YouTubes because uh, they're so sweet of these little kids and sometimes not so little kids that have had the cochlear implants. They've been in a world of silence their whole lives and, and maybe they've had the cochlear implants or just gotten the hearing aids, but they get to hear sound for the first time. I'm, I'm gonna have the guys show you a short little video, about 20 second video of a little boy named Connor who's hearing his dad and mom's voice for the first time. Watch his face, take a look at this. Hi Cooper. <laughs> Just 
just absolute joy on their face, right? Just the, the absolute sheer happiness that that boy gets hearing his little sister's voice, the, 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 his two parents. And it's a miracle for sure because up until that point, his world had been completely filled with silence. But now he hears noises and they're magnificent and they cherish them. Now, to this, I want to share uh, one of the fellows that was pictured on the screen named Brody. He has a nephew that uh, had the cochlear implants and did not have any sound in his life until he was five years old. His name's Bowen. Bowen. And Bowen goes to school. He's in second grade now, which I think makes him like seven. He goes to school every day. And when he gets home, do you know what the first thing he does is? He takes his hearing aids out. He does it for an hour every day. It's as if Bowen is saying... I've heard enough. I've heard just enough. He knows the need for quiet. He actually knows the peace for quiet, even amidst the noise. The noise doesn't stop. He has brothers and sisters. They're watching TV. They're doing stuff. The noise doesn't go away, but he just separates himself from it. I, I thought this is a wonderful thing because the question is, is our noise drowning us out. What is our noise drowning out? out? Are we deaf to the spiritual things of life? Has silence, has time to contemplate with God the big and small issues of our lives simply been drowned out from our lives? The scriptures remind us that we have a home in the Lord. In Psalm 90 it says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all of the generations. So as you go to your homes, I remind you to take the moment to unplug. Take a moment with the Lord to unplug, to let and make the noise be quiet. Take a moment to look at the world and simply say, like little Bowen does, I have heard enough of you for right now. And just listen to God. And there is you, trust God with your worries, your dissonance, and waiting for answers to the big questions of life, I promise you, you will find gateway you will find it to be the gateway to hope and peace. It's a gateway you should take. It's there for you. One of the other hymns in the Jewish hymnal, Psalm 46, starts like this. It says, be still. Take the daily contemplative moments that are in front of you. And it goes on and says, be still and know. Know in your silence you're ready for a meeting with God. It goes on to say, be still and know that I am God. In the stillness and the quiet place, know that God is God. We need not carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. He is quite comfortable, and he does it, frankly, with great ease and little effort. So in your quiet place, unplug and give your questions, your tensions, your worries, your everything to God. The opportunity and the hope and peace is in front of you. In the name of Jesus, I encourage you to take it. You're the beloved of God. It's been so good to be with you here. It's good to be with you that are attending online. God bless you. Have wonderful days. Amen. Mm -hmm.